Blockchains explained. Welcome to the Crypto Rambo channel. My name is Desiree. The purpose of this video is to work through as well as share my own knowledge of what blockchains are for your understanding. I'm going to go from a bit of a technical perspective and then make another video about the impact it will have in the future. That's blockchain technology. I'm going to start with an overview and then go into detail. The blockchain can be thought of as a distributed ledger system. The key terms here are distributed and ledger. Distributed being the opposite of centralized or being in one location and ledger being a continuous recording of events, usually meaning transactions. Blockchains comprise of data or information that's organized in succeeding blocks, one after the other in a chronological or time-based order to form a chain. The block is just a collection of information in a standardized format among all the blocks. So the blockchain is non-physical and can be thought of as a database. So you can expect to find the same fields, for example, date or amount within each block, but the data attached to those fields change, capturing what happens from one moment to the next. Before getting into what is actually in the blocks and what happens when a new block is added, Let's look at why it's distributed. It is distributed because by design, the information is not owned or updated by one person or one central group. This is called a distributed consensus. There has to be a network of people and this network can be joined by anyone at a node or connection point through a computer interface and the information can be updated by anyone who has the right resources to do so. There are ways to verify that the information recorded is accurate and make it almost impossible for those updating the blockchain to change it in their favor, much more so than the centralized ledgers that have existed in human history. One thing to note is that the blockchain, as it is information, is written in programming languages, but the specific language can change depending on the blockchain, and the kind of content within it can change as well. The blockchain itself is just specifying what kind of information and how it should be written, but the programming language used to do it can change. So Bitcoin, arguably the most popular use of a blockchain, is just a blockchain being used as a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin's blockchain doesn't have the same content as another's, say Ethereum, is not necessarily written in the same language and does not serve the same purpose. Regardless, there can be commonalities between different blockchains, such as the basic structure and methods used to secure the information on it. That's actually all you need to know about blockchain technology, that it's decentralized information stored in blocks and that it is continually updated over time. But I'm going to go into some more detail using Bitcoin as the example. For Bitcoin, it's a peer-to-peer -peer or distributed monetary system or peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system as coined by its mysterious creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. It's a way to define and store value, move that value from person to person, accurately track that movement, make sure the right person is doing the movement, as well as ability to mine or add to the already existing amount. The blockchain itself is a mechanism by which this is done. There are no physical coins, just information, but for lack of a better term, from a coin is first created, one can track its location as belonging to one person and then its movement as bits of it or all of it is moved from person to person. So the ledger or blockchain is actually tracking who spends how much with whom and when. When there's a transaction, there are inputs and outputs created to say how much was received and how much was spent. The unspent amount is seen as remaining at the address because it can be calculated that a certain amount was received and a certain amount not spent and so that certain amount can be spent in the future. Instead of a person, an address is used, in this case a string of characters which may or may not be able to be linked to an individual, depending on their security. The address is actually a key, actually a hash of a key, just one of a key pair, something used in public key or asymmetric cryptography. The address that is recorded on the blockchain as having sent or received funds is the public address that someone can share, but only the owner of the other key in the pair, that's the private key or private address, has the ability to spend the funds once received. For more information on public key cryptography, watch my video called What is Cryptography or read up for more information on your own. 
the blockchain just records how the funds are moving. When someone unlocks their wallet with their private key and decides to send it to someone else's address, this transaction information is broadcast to the rest of the network. There are special nodes on the network called binaries who are able to write that transaction to the blockchain. The transaction is not complete until this is done. The first step is to verify that the sender has those funds to be spent because the history of all transactions on the blockchain can be checked and so unspent amounts calculated. The second step is to record the new transaction with others broadcasted around the same time onto the blockchain by compiling them so that they form a block and then adding that block to the blockchain. Miners do both of these steps. Since anyone can decide to be a miner and participate in the blockchain, there has to be a system by which to decide which miner gets to do it. First of all, at this point, for Bitcoin, miners have to have specialized computers called ASICs, that's Application Specific Integrated Circuits, built specifically for mining crypto that allow them to write to the blockchain. Back in the day, one could have just used a regular old CPU, but things got a little difficult over time, as I'll explain. This is because the miners have to compete to figure out who gets the right to add the next set of transactions to the blockchain. They do this by performing a calculation that takes a very long time, figuring out a hash that begins with a certain number of zeros. A hash is the output after shortening an arbitrarily sized string of characters or input to a specific length. Blockchains use a cryptographic hash function, which among its other features means one can't figure out the original information from looking at the hash and changing even one character or data point in the original information drastically changes the resulting hash. Bitcoin specifically uses SHA-256, that secure hash algorithm. Different mining computers have different hash rates, but the idea is that since many miners are working to solve this problem at the same time, the probability of the correct hash being found can be predicted to make it so that only one miner at a time is likely to find it, and so be able to write the new block. It also decreases the chances of one miner being able to do it successively, and so write information in their favor. Miners are basically just arbitrarily adding characters that is searching for a nonce, that's exactly what it sounds like, to the new set of transactions in order to put it in the new block until the right combination is found that results in the right hash with the correct number of zeros at the beginning and that fit into the data block. Each block generally has multiple transactions in it, and the information in one block is actually a hash of the previous block as a header, the current transactions being written to it, and some extra characters, the nonce, that are combined with those two previous things in order to come up with the hash that has a special number of zeros. The time it takes for all the different miners on the blockchain network to compete and then one miner win is about 10 minutes. So a new block is added every 10 minutes. The number of zeros needed is lengthened gradually in order to keep that time being 10 minutes. This is necessary because more miners with faster computers participate in the network over time. So the difficulty of the hashing problem has to increase as well in order to maintain that 10 minute time frame. This time and method of competing for the right to add a block is specific to Bitcoin although other blockchains and cryptocurrencies could have it too. This kind of right to add a block through calculating hashes is called proof of work mining. Even though it takes a very long time to calculate the hash, it does not take such a long time for other miners to verify that the hash is correct. This continuous process of each new block being compressed to form its own hash, then that hash being merged with new transaction information to form the next block, results in what is called a Merkle tree. Although one can look back in time to view every transaction that ever occurred on the blockchain, using a block explorer for example, the continuous compiling of the previous hash into the next results in data integrity, where one can quickly check that the most recent block information is true without having to look at all the transactions. So blockchains can also be viewed as Merkle trees with a new hash being formed combining all previous hashes, so one cannot lie about what happened before. Like saying you never spent money, you did spend, as it would change the whole blockchain. I don't know about you, but I'm getting kind of tired of talking about this, so I'm going to take a break and go sip some tea or something and be right back. Getting back to explaining how this works in Bitcoin's blockchain, I mentioned that the block itself contains a hash of the previous block, the new transactions, and then the extra information to find the right hash. Because each new block has the last block's hash in it and the hash changes if anything from the original message is changed, this prevents anyone from tampering with the blockchain. The important thing to note here is that the miners competing for the right to add the next block 
of data with new transaction information prevents what is called a double spend attack from happening. That's someone spending the same funds twice and trying to lie to the network about it. Because all the miners receive new transaction broadcasts, they all begin to compile new blocks whenever they receive those transactions, and then take some time to figure out what the right nonce is to be added. The first one to win the proof of work broadcasts his, her, whatever version of the blockchain with their new block, and that is accepted because other miners can see that the transactions in it were viable by checking what's unspent at that address, and they can see that the right nonce was found. At this point, miners begin to compile the next block using this newly accepted blockchain, referencing the hash of this newly accepted block. If two miners somehow solve this at the same time, a very low probability, by the way, two versions of the blockchain are created with a different transaction ordering and both broadcasted. Each miner begins working to add the next block based on whichever one is received first. The longest version of the blockchain is the one that is accepted as valid. If someone were to attempt to double spend by spending the inputs of a transaction and then trying to spend them again when they don't have the funds, they would write a new block spending the funds they already spent elsewhere, replacing the one with the initially spent funds and other miners would then deny the second transaction, which could hurt the receiver of the initial funds. But this bad person would have to do this faster than other miners can write the blockchain. This would be very difficult to do because they would need to have the computing power necessary to outcompete the other miners with their version of the blockchain that is longer than everyone else's. They have to write all the new blocks based off of their new deceitful block since all blocks reference the one prior, and it has to be longer than everyone else's to be accepted by the rest of the network. Because other miners were already working on writing the new block when the first correct transaction was sent to the first receiver, and they have been adding to it, they have the hash from the block with the correct information included in all subsequent blocks, and they statistically speaking are faster at writing them than the bad person could ever be. That person can't just slip in her or his second transaction that robs from the initial receiver because she has to write that block plus all the next blocks until it is longer than the other chain that the other miners on the network have already been creating. The odds of this dishonest person or miner being able to do this and write the second transaction to the blockchain, creating the longest one faster than everyone else, is very very low, as thought out in the original idea for Bitcoin. This is why it's suggested that after spending funds, you should wait for a certain number of confirmations as a new block's being created to make sure that enough time has passed where a dishonest person's probability of catching up to recreate a new chain where your funds are spent again is negligibly low. There is the issue of mining pools being able to combine computing power and so having the ability to do double spend attacks. The benchmark is having over 51% of hashing power on the network. At this point in Bitcoin, this is only solved by mining pools deciding to limit themselves. Another method of attack is to cripple other nodes or miners and so automatically defer mining power to those other miners who may then have the majority of it, of mining power, thus being able to keep right into the blockchain, which is likely to end up being the longest one. Other blockchains such as Particle, or what Ethereum is working on implementing right now, work on proof of stake instead to provide distributed consensus. Apart from verifying that the transaction is valid and order the transactions, miners also create new bitcoins in the first transaction that is added to the block. This is called a block reward and why it's called mining and is an incentive for miners. This block reward is set to decrease every few years until it is no more. In the future, when there are no more block rewards, miners will be able to receive transaction fees based on simple economics deferring to the participants willing to pay the higher fees for their transactions. As a side note, this hashing to write blocks and the use of the public and private key pair for sender verification is the only cryptography that actually exists in Bitcoin and data is not actually encrypted on the blockchain. One cannot undo hashes to decrypt the data and see what was there, even though it's compressed using a cryptographic hash function. And the actual transactions are recorded because one can look back at transaction history for each block, but that is not hidden from anyone who wishes to look. 
The cryptographic security of the Bitcoin blockchain is in the fact that only the person with the right private key can move their funds, that the address is not necessarily linked to a person, that distributed consensus is needed to verify transactions, and that the data in a Merkle tree structure cannot be altered after it is written. Other blockchains are emerging, such as privacy coins, like Particle, that provide much more security, and there are also other blockchain solutions that encrypt the data itself before it is written to the blockchain. To recap, a blockchain acts as a public ledger, recorded information, transactions in the case of Bitcoin, in a time-based manner, using a decentralized network to update it. It is immutable, meaning once the data is there, it cannot be changed. It is publicly verifiable and doesn't rely on one institution, like a bank, to update it or validate it. It is secure in that it uses cryptography in the form of a public and private key system to ensure that only the right persons can move funds. The major issue it solves is that it removes the need for trust and discourages fraudulence from a centralized institution. It does not only have to be used as an electronic payment system, as in cryptocurrencies, but any database with records can use a blockchain as its underlying technology. I have to add that this is not a perfect explanation because it would have taken an even longer time, especially the intricacies because adding one detail means explaining it. I hope that this was really useful for you. Leave any comments or questions below. I'd love to read them. I'll be talking about the implications of blockchain technology in the future. Please subscribe and keep up and come back for more.